So another group who was profoundly affected by the war were Asian Americans in the United States. Asian Americans' war experience was filled with paradox. More than 50,000 children of Asian immigrants fought in the army, mostly in segregated units. For the Chinese, you actually get something of an improvement. The Chinese Exclusion Act is abolished in 1943 since China is now an ally of the United States in the Pacific. However, the annual national quota for Chinese immigrants was set at only 105 individuals, which was hardly generous. But the image of, Ch of the Chinese as gallant fighters defending their country called into question some of the long-standing racial stereotypes with some interesting results. The American government, however, viewed every person of Japanese ethnicity as a potential spy. On both sides, the Pacific War was seen as something of a race war. For the Japanese, they portrayed Americans as self-indulgent people contaminated by ethnic and racial diversity. Whereas Americans' long-standing prejudices combined with the attack on Pearl Harbor to produce an unprecedented hatred. They portrayed the Japanese as rats, bestial, and subhuman, as we've seen already. Unlike with Germans and Italians, whose tyrannical rulers were the main reason for the country's actions in American eyes, the Japanese aggression was blamed on an inborn, violent, racial, or national character. The government bent over backwards to include German and Italian Americans in the war effort, but they viewed every person of Japanese ethnicity suspiciously, which ultimately led to one of the greatest travesties in American history, the internment of Japanese Americans. Inspired by exaggerated fears of Japanese invasion of the West Coast and the pressure from white Americans who saw an opportunity to seize Japanese American property, the military persuaded Roosevelt to issue Executive Order 9066. In February of 1942, we see the order to relocate all persons of Japanese descent from the West Coast. More than 110,000 people were moved from West Coast cities and nearly two-thirds of them were American citizens. While in the camps, the internees were subject to quasi-military discipline. Now, importantly, internment did not apply to people of Japanese descent in Hawaii even though Hawaii was perhaps more vulnerable than the west coast of the United States. But there, Japanese descended people made up nearly 40% of the overall population, and to remove them would mean that the economy in Hawaii would not be able to function. Internment revealed just how easily the war can undermine basic human freedoms. Hardly anyone spoke out against internment. There were no court hearings, no due process, and no writs of habeas corpus as people were being removed forcefully from their homes. And the courts, by and large, refused to intervene. In the case of Korematsu versus the United States in 1944, the Supreme Court upheld the constitutionality of internment when college student Fred Korematsu refused to present himself for internment and was arrested and then later challenged that arrest in court. To this day, the court has never overturned the decision in Korematsu and so remains part of US legal precedent today. The government also developed a loyalty oath program and drafted internees into the army. Some of them refused and around 200 were sent to prison for resisting the draft. However, roughly 20,000 people joined the army from the internment camps, along with around 13,000 Japanese Americans from Hawaii. Now, one of the more famous internees in the United States is actor George Takai of Star Trek fame. And in this short video, he will explain a little bit of his experience in the internment camps as a child. And where did you grow up? I grew up here in Los Angeles until Pearl Harbor. And then, as I think you know, uh, Japanese Americans on the West Coast were summarily rounded up and uh, sent into uh, 10 barbed wire internment camps. Uh, 
I was uh, four at the time of uh, Pearl Harbor, and I was too young to really understand what was going on. But I still do remember that day uh, when uh, armed soldiers, soldiers with guns, bayonets on them, came to our home to order us out. I remember that as a very scary day. And, you know, a child can sense your parents' anxieties. And we were taken from our home to um, a horse table in, uh, uh, at uh, San Anita Racetrack, where we were housed for a few months uh, while the camps were being built. And uh, when the camp was built, we were put on a train and taken all the way across the uh, southwestern desert to the swamps of Arkansas, a camp called Roller. And I grew up uh, there for a portion of the war. And then we were transferred from that camp to another camp in Northern California called Tootie Lake, which was an even more uh, harsh uh, camp. There were three barbed wire, uh, three levels of barbed wire fence and tanks patrolling the peri uh, perimeter. And uh, after the war, we came back home to Los Angeles. Now, why were you transferred from Camp Roar to Camp Tula Lake? Yes, there's a... Um, a dark chapter of American history in that. Um, immigrants coming to the United States could all aspire to someday becoming naturalized American citizens, except one group of immigrants, immigrants from Asia. And uh, so uh, for, uh, for all arts and purposes at that time, uh, it was excluding Chinese and Japanese immigrants to the United States. They could not be uh, naturalized. Um, when the war broke out, um, young Japanese American men and women rushed to the, uh, their uh, local uh, recruitment boards to volunteer to serve in the uh, U.S. Army. But um, because we looked like the enemy, and simply for that, uh, we were rejected from service. Uh, those that um, um, volunteered to uh, serve were classified as 4C which means enemy, non-alien. Now that's a very peculiar term, non-alien. It means a citizen. We couldn't even be called enemy citizens. We were called enemy non-aliens, and they were rejected from service. And we were all incarcerated. But a year into internment, the government realized they had a manpower shortage, and here was, uh, here was all this manpower. Uh, that we've incarcerated uh, under the, the label of being potential spies, saboteurs, uh, traitors. How do we tap this manpower? So they came down with what was called a loyalty questionnaire, which in its, uh, on the surface sounds outrageous. After they've taken our property, our homes, our businesses, our freedom, and incarcerated us for a year. They want to test our loyalty. It was a series of about 40 questions, and every, everyone in, in these internment camps had to respond, everyone over 17 years of age had to respond to this, uh, answer the uh, questions in the loyalty questionnaire. A 17-year-old girl or a 80-year-old immigrant lady all had to respond to this questionnaire. There were two key questions that uh, the government wanted answers to. Question 27 asked, will you bear arms to defend the United States of America? Can you imagine this question being posed to an 88-year-old immigrant lady or a 17-year-old girl? Question 28, and this was only one sentence, but it had two ideas. It said, it asked, will you swear your loyalty to the United States of America and forswear your loyalty to the Emperor of Japan? Now, for a Japanese American, someone born and raised here, the word forswear your loyalty to the Emperor was very offensive because it assumed that by birth you were ingrained with an inborn loyalty to the em Emperor. I mean, you know, you can't forswear something that doesn't exist. So that the government assumed that there was an existing loyalty just because we looked like this. 
And so if you answered no, meaning I don't have a loyalty to the emperor to forswear, they were, uh, they, uh, you were also saying no to the first part. Will you swear your loyalty to the United States? If you uh, answered yes, meaning yes, I will be loyal, you were, aha, uh -huh, fessing up that you had been loyal to the emperor and the government had, uh, was justified in, uh, in putting you in an internment camp. It was, uh, it, it turned all ten camps into turmoil. My father, as I said, was born in Japan and ineligible for citizenship by, by government, you know, decree. He said, Gaul, uh, to ask me this after they, they've taken my property, my home, everything. I am, there's, they ta they've taken everything, but they, there's one thing that they can't take, and that's my dignity. I am not going to grovel before this government. And he answered no to those two questions. And my mother, I mean, you know, she's uh, a young mother with three young children, one a baby. You know, they expect her to go off and carry a gun and fight? No. She said, this is nonsense. I'm not going to subject myself to it. And she also answered no to those two key questions. And because of that, we were removed from uh, the uh, camp in uh, Arkansas to the camp in Northern California. And that's why they had three layers of barbed wire fence. We were disloyal. So a long campaign for acknowledgement of the injustice of internment followed the end of the war. And finally, in 1988, Congress issued an apology and provided $20,000 in compensation to each surviving victim of Japanese internment in the United States.